this is a, a really interesting area because it spans a national border, a couple different provinces or states. They are supposed to have free passage between these places, but it's been complicated. It was complicated before, and it got even more complicated after COVID. This border got trickier to navigate. But this is a real thing in New York, a real issue for not too far away from us. And Audra Simpson wrote a book called Mohawk Interruptus, Political Life Across the Borders of Settler States. And this piece is actually called Consent's Revenge, is a reflection on what she did in that book. Now, one of the things she mentions at the beginning of this chapter, which is curious, is she says that our band council was evicting non-Native people from the community. The evictions were of a piece with a 50% blood quantum requirement for membership. First of all, there's a couple weird things going on. The idea of blood quantum is, in some ways, you might say, a rather, how, how to put it? It's a settler colonialist idea, right? Yeah, it's very American. And we use it to measure, like, race, for example. So in the United States, we used it to classify African American or Black. Famously, in southern states, there would be classifications based on the one-drop rule or one grandparent or one great-grandparent. And so traditionally in the United States, people have been assigned to the socially inferior status. I would say that for indigenous people in the United States, 50% blood quantum, from my knowledge, it would be a pretty high bar. <laughs> that would be evicting a lot of people. What's interesting to me is if you were doing this as an ethnography, like let's say you were going into this community and you were doing an ethnography or an anthropology of what is going on, what might you be describing here? What would you say about this situation if people are being evicted 50% blood quantum requirement that was vigorously debated, contested, embraced, defended. What might an anthropologist say going into this situation? Well, you definitely want to talk about how did this happen? Where did we get these ideas about blood quantum memberships? Who's doing this? What are the power relations involved, right? And so Basically, a lot of anthropologists would talk about the complexity of this and the internal politics and the difference between what the leadership might be doing and the community members. If you remember that Delmos Jones article about what the, the community leaders were doing as opposed to what the community members were up to and where he cited, this might be something where some anthropologists might be talking about what is the deal going on here. She is a member of that community and takes a, a very different approach. She says, well, what was crucial were the very deliberate, willful, intentional actions that people were making in the face of the expectation that they consent to their own elimination as a people, that they consent to having their land taken, their lives controlled, and their stories told for them. So I think what she's saying here is that there are things going on internally, but the bigger context is that people are having their lives controlled and their stories told for them. And so in this article, she says that they aren't playing that game. Or as they say, enough is enough. And by not playing that game... What she is talking about is, among these games is citizenship, voting, paying taxes, actions that would move Mohawks out of their own sovereignty into settler citizenship and into the promise of whiteness. So she says they're not playing these games. Among these games is citizenship, voting, and paying taxes. By the way, what do we usually think about people who don't vote or pay their taxes? I'm supposed to encourage you to vote, right? That's what I'm supposed to be doing, right? That we're all supposed to be encouraging people to vote. And so she's saying that they're not playing these games. They're not going to vote. 
They're not going to pay taxes because if they did, that moves them out of their own sovereignty. And so what she's saying is that they refuse to consent to the apparatuses of the state. I have to say, I don't know entirely what to think about this because it's a hard thing because the things that I would encourage people to do, like vote, pay taxes, et cetera. I certainly don't want the rich people getting off not paying taxes. That sounds, that's terrible. But we're all supposed to be citizens here, but refuse to consent to the apparatuses of the state. And so she says that as an anthropologist, she's not going to play that game either. She says that I refused to be that thick description prose master who would reveal in florid detail the ways in which these things were being sorted out. What she's saying is she's not going to give us this thick, rich description of the complexities and internal politics of the group she's working with, because she knows that those are going to be interpreted in a way by outsiders like me, maybe, as being evidence of people who are not doing what they should be doing, etc. And so she said that she was not going to write in a way that could be used for these other kinds of stories. It's a pretty intense situation, and it's an intense choice to make as an anthropologist. So she says that this is part of refusal. It is just this sort of cognizance of differing social and historical facts that make for the posture of refusal, the posture of refusal. So she's saying that there's a refusal of people to do things that they should, or that we say they should, and a refusal of the anthropologist. And that refusal holds on to a truth, structures this truth as stands through time as its own structure and co-mingling with the force of presumed and inevitable disappearance and operates as the revenge of consent. Another big word, revenge, right? And she says she doesn't mean individual harm. She means avenging a prior of injustice and pointing to its ongoing life in the present. Now, this is definitely hard to grapple with. It's hard to understand, first of all, what exactly she's saying. But it's also difficult to grapple with the concept because these are not things that we usually sanction in state societies, right? The idea that the state is the one that is supposed to mete out justice. People are not supposed to take revenge. And again, she's not saying individual revenge, but even in a collective sense, revenge is not supposed to be part of the state apparatus. So again, this is pretty intense. She's saying that people are still living this out. It's not something that is all gone. It operates like a grammar and posture that sits through time. I was really struck by the assertion on page 387 that, that North America is not post-colonial. And so in some places, we talk about the post-colonial state and the idea that there were colonizers. People often use this word, for example, to refer to, say, India, that it is post-colonial. And so, you know, it's to indicate that some, many of the colonial structures remain in place, even though there is technically independence. So this is a word that is used in much of Latin America, Asia, Africa, the idea of being post-colonial. She says that North America isn't post-colonial because they never left, the natives never disappeared. And so in some ways, if you interpret this most simply, from an indigenous or a native point of view, th this is a, still remains a colonial situation. And we're not post-colonial at all. It's not like they have sovereignty. It's not post-colonial. It's it's colonial. They never left. The natives, the native never disappeared. I'm sorry, she said native. The native never disappeared. And so, as she says or asks, do you consent? The reason they don't they don't want to do these things is do you consent to the lawful theft of your land? 
because that's what it would mean to consent consent here. Yeah, pretty intense. Let's go back to Ferguson. This was 2014. Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. They do locate this in a trajectory. The trajectory goes back to something that happened when I was in college, which was the Rodney King beating, which was one of the first that was actually captured on a home VHS tape and depicted Rodney King being beaten in Los Angeles by four police officers. There were marches, the so-called Los Angeles riots. These were some of the first, or some of the first marches and stuff based on recordings of police violence in action. Police officers were all acquitted in that case, even though the evidence seems so convincing. There was then in 2012, Trayvon Martin. After the 2014, what happened, there was a, a huge protest in, in Ferguson. And that was when we saw this huge police presence brought in. And as you can see here, this was from ABC News. Apparently might be owned by the Walt Disney Company, so we know they're neutral. Everybody was commenting how it seemed like the police departments had acquired access to military equipment that was being used both abroad, but also on our own city streets. And so it was much commented on at the time, of, even by the Walt Disney Company, of how the police had been militarized, and that's what was going on there. Oh, look at page 382. Other tweets recontextualize its situation in Ferguson as part of global affairs. Remember, this is 2014, 10 years ago. So it'd be hashtag Egypt, hashtag Palestine, hashtag Ferguson, hashtag Turkey. U.S. made tear gas sold on the almighty free market represses democracy. Oh, that's quite a tweet for that time. Remember, this is the time of the, the some, uh, fights for democracy in the Middle East as well. That's pretty intense, too. Reading this article, I really started to wonder how we got from the summer of 2020 you remember the summer of 2020? This was about four years ago. Now, in the summer of 2020, if I remember correctly, we all knew about police violence. That was very top of mind, and we knew about the militarization because we'd already heard about it. I feel like during that time, there was a decent amount of support for Black Lives Matter and for reforming if not doing more to reform the police. Am I making this up? Remember that? Yeah, that's what I remember. I remember there being support for the people who were protesting at Standing Rock. I showed you some clips from protesting the pipeline. I remember people from here even going out to stand with the indigenous people at Standing Rock. Going back to a Simpson quote, the condition of indigeneity globally is to know this. Indigenous peoples are grappling with the fiction of justice while pushing for justice. Again, there were these cross-border global movements pushing for justice. Something else was happening at the time, which was a pushback throughout the Trump administration, was that People were fighting against these policies of separating migrant families at the border. People were on the side of, at least to a certain extent, refugees of trying to band together, not to be deporting people all the time. And so there was this, at least if I remember correctly, this was what things were like four years ago in the summer. What I don't entirely understand is what's going on now. How the same exact institutions, the colleges and the universities who put out these statements 
against police violence. Perhaps they did not support, but state specific, explicitly support Black Lives Matter, but certainly against militarizing the police. If I'm looking out over today's world, at least the headlines that I'm seeing and the police presence that I'm seeing is they're now bringing in the police. The very same buildings that the Columbia protesters occupied were once occupied during Vietnam, during which Columbia did also bring in the police, but they were also occupied. I just read this on what used to be Twitter. They were also occupied during the protests against apartheid in South Africa, and they didn't bring in the police then. So I'm confused about why so many people want to bring in the police and why so many people are calling for students to be expelled and arrested. That's uh, it's something. And I do not understand. I feel like this is happening, and I know there are a lot of support for people who are protesting, but there sure are a lot of people who are making fun of them or mocking them or misunderstanding them. I don't know. I don't know if this is new, but it doesn't feel the same as I feel like this was not happening in the same sense in summer 2020. I don't know how we got to here. And I certainly know that as opposed to the policies that would limit at least family separation, there are increasingly loud cries for border enforcement and militarizing the border and those kinds of issues. So, like I said, I'm not sure how we got to here. Any ideas?